you. Uh, thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here today again at this very distinguished uh, institution. Uh, thank uh, my good friend, Farash, and uh, his colleagues for inviting me. And my interest by the number of people showing up. And the afternoon, you know, I was in New York just four years ago, four weeks ago. I saw so many people there, but not to this level, of course, for a uh, speech for the Secretariat, uh, people who are working in the Middle East. Uh, and I saw so many people, and I shared with them a joke on the United Nations, which I wanted to start by that joke and by being impressed. You know, in the United Nations, our diplomats usually, they have to read the speeches of the governments and clear the national position and sometimes uh, see, uh, time is not enough they go over time even till midnight there is no time slot for them and nobody is in the room but they have to read the speech once a uh, diplomat uh, goes to read the speech the only person in the meeting is the chair who had to be there and one audience. Hmm? So he thanks the chair and he thanks that person. Thank you for listen, staying to listen to me. And you know the audience, that person's answer, no, I'm the next speaker. <laughs> so for me, being exposed to you and, and having such a wonderful gathering by itself is very reflective of the program that you have, which I really like. When they told me the title, I have to say I was very impressed. Peace and diplomacy. I think these are the two public goods, commodities that we do need everywhere, every time. Uh, this is why I don't uh, start by jokes usually by, on diplomats. Uh, but I think beyond any joke, diplomacy is one of the most needed commodities of today life as it was not just centuries ago but millenniums ago. I, I'm sure you have studied the history of diplomacy but it's, it started when as they say our fathers and mothers were not living as, as a, we live today for their daily life each day they had to go to hunting with their tribes and, uh, you know, hunt a, something to cook or to eat. And sometimes they had conflict on their hunting zones. Why your tribe has entered to my zone and why you have crossed the border. You know what usually they did uh, millenniums ago when we were in hunting era. They didn't start by killing each other. They used to choose somebody as a representative to send to the other tribe with gifts sometimes. And of course, you, the, peop, the persons who were sent were much smarter, able to communicate, able to negotiate, able to end the conflict peacefully. This is the gist of diplomacy, the spirit of diplomacy, which I think has been consistently there. The spirit is the same, the format of course has changed. And I think we needed at that time, we needed it, need it today. The same with peace. There is no peace, there is no life. And this is why I think the combination is so interesting and uh, with this uh, personal emotional attachment to these two concepts, I would like to be professorial and to raise one conceptual question and try to answer it, not in diplomatic way. <coughs> and you know my jokes, some of them, I don't want to repeat what I used before, but this one, maybe 
heard by some of you that what's the difference between a, a, a professor, an ambassador, and a general. Hmm? Have you heard it? And the answer is, if you ask a question from a general, you hear yes, the answer is yes. If you hear no, the answer is no. If you hear maybe, that person is not a general, no? Because generals should be very precise, that on the mark, straight. But if, with all due respect to the ambassadors, I call this person the ambassador, so it's a joke. If you ask a question from an ambassador, and you hear yes, the real answer is maybe. Hmm? If you hear maybe, the real answer is no. And if you hear no, that person is not an ambassador. Huh? Because they shouldn't say no ever. Now if you ask a professor a question, you need and never hear yes or no. You will say we need conceptual frameworks. Huh? On the one hand is this, on the other hand is... Actually, I was saying this shows in Pakistan a couple of years ago, and the chair of that institute during the dinner told me, you are so right, because we had a professor here, when we used to ask him question, his answer was, your question has two sides of equal importance. On the one hand is this, on the other hand is that. So, I raised one question. That how the relationship between Iran's foreign policy and peace and diplomacy can be understood. Or can be analyzed. So there is one conceptual question. And my answer to this, why and how? The question is why we should study this relationship. Of course, I would answer it uh, shorter, but the question is how. Why and how Iranian relationship between Iranian foreign policy and its relationship between peace and, security, uh, and diplomacy can be understood. My conceptual framework is very easy. A, B, C. A. Why this question should be raised today? A is what are called American anti-diplomatic approach. B, or again, American anti-diplomatic approach needs scrutiny. Uh, analytically, I mean, my B is building peace without Iran in the region is an impossibility, and my C is cooperation with Iran through diplomacy has been working in different areas, including the bilateral relationship between Iran and Turkey, which I would focus a little bit in that. So let me go to these ABCs. A, American uh, uh, anti-diplomatic approach. Number one fact. Iran negotiated for two years and a half huh? uh, with six parties, five plus one, including United States, through, of course, a multilateral diplomatic channel. That was the UN resolution, United, uh, United Nations Security, uh, Security Council resolution, and reached what we call it JCPOA. It was absolutely a diplomatic approach. Hmm? through diplomatic means. And it was one of the most important negotiations uh, in diplomatic history. Why? Because a developing country negotiated with big powers. <coughs> and uh, it happened in a very speci special uh, regional context, global context, and so on and so forth. But what the U.S. did during Trump administration. Hmm? Cancer? It's actually abrogated its own commitment, which was very undiplomatic. Without any diplomatic justification, any legal justification. And I think all what they did was against their own signature. Very simple fact. Second fact that during, especially the last year or so, the U.S. has been 
so against international law, against diplomacy, in what it is called by them maximum <coughs> pressure. Maximum pressure to do what? To accept the will of a superpower, which is an impossibility for a country like Iran, because this country is, I mean, the political system is the byproduct of a revolution. The revolution was based on a three-part motto, Estallal Azadi Jumuri Islami. Estallal means independence, Azadi means liberty, and Islamic Republic, Jumuri Islami. So Estallal means to be independent, not to accept the means of the others. And I think vis-a-vis -vis maximum pressure would be maximum resistance and it will work. But the use approach is very undiplomatic and against international law, against international organization, against all the achievements of diplomacy. The third point is the issue goes beyond Iran. It's not just Iran. Iran is as a pretext. I think the United States is trying to impose its hegemony on even it, on its allies even. Not just the rest of the world, it is restoration of hegemony, which is also an impossibility, because the era of hegemony has gone. It is impossible to have hegemony in today's world anymore. Either a global hegemony or a regional hegemony. And I think through the uh, examination of the United States is doing, you may conclude that it is not out of strength, it is out of weakness, a fear of losing, and so on and so forth, that the U.S. is acting so undiplomatically. This is why we have to study Iran, and Iran is not just an issue for Iranians, I think Iran is an issue for any student of international politics today because the destiny and the final eventuality of what's happening vis-a-vis -vis Iran is going to impact not just Iran per se, but the region and the global uh, situation. So if A is clear, the issue is relating to diplomacy and peace, now let's go to my B. Is it possible to build peace and security in the region without Iran? The answer is simply, very clearly, no. It's not diplomatic. Why? Because of several factors. First, is the geopolitics of Iran. Can you name any conflict crisis in our surroundings, in, the, in West Asia that if Iran is ignored, if Iran is marginalized, if Iran is somehow demonized, then you can have peace and security. Impossible. Second, Iranian diplomacy has been a peacemaking diplomacy. Regardless of all labeling and frame, look, my good friends, now the fight is not just a fight by military means into the international politics. The fight is fighting on labeling and narrating and framing. So we have a very deep fight going on on narrative buildings, on labeling the others. There is so much demonization of Iran in today's world, especially by the American, I have to say, hegemonic media and press that Iran is doing so, is doing so, what we call demonization of Iran. Iran in the region, Iranian so-called behavior in the region. These, some of them are very simplistic, very 
reduction is very alarmistic. But as a student of the field, you know each of these files in the region, be it uh, Iraqi file, Syrian file, Yemeni file, Palestinian file, Afghanistan file, subcontinent file, differs from the others. You cannot generalize not just Iran's uh, role and attachment and Iranian component in these files from each other, but any other actor that you study, you cannot generalize. And I think this labeling is so intense. Demonization is so heavy, but it is artificial. It doesn't relate to reality. And I think this is very, very important fundamental point, which uh, I hope we can discuss in detail maybe later. But look at all the files. What Iran has done is not just by the logic of geo geopolitics, it is by choice. By choice, Iran is for peace and security in the region. Look at the Persian Gulf as a case. In the Persian Gulf, it, is, it has been the consistent policy of Iran that we are for reducing the tensions, for conflict management, you are not interested in militarization, for bringing extra regional players to this whole, uh, let's say, area. Furthermore, very specifically, our foreign minister during the last uh, almost six years has been consistently reminding everybody that operative paragraph operative number or operative paragraph number 8 of resolution 598 can be used utilized for making a regional security dialogue a possibility Iran Iraq war ended almost 30 years ago by a resolution of security council of United Nations called resolution 598 and operative paragraph number eight asks the Secretary General of the United Nations to organize a regional meeting for the discussion, debate, <coughs> dialogue on regional security issues. And Iran persistently has been saying so. So I think uh, peace is a commodity that we need and regional peace is a necessity for all of us and I think Iranian policy and I can go to details on all files has been consistently making peace a possibility for everybody. Iran is a builder of the peace in, in this regard. And why? Because peace benefits Iran simply benefits every, everybody of us, and zero-sum game mentality doesn't work. Now let me go to my C, cooperation through diplomacy. Uh, Iran attaches so much importance to diplomacy, and it's not new. It is in the Iranian culture, and Iranian culture is not new. As our neighbor, we know about each other in good details, maybe the rest of the world doesn't, doesn't know. You know Ferdowsi, huh? Ferdowsi is one of our great poets. You have six great poets. And he has a book of epic called Shah Naman, huh? And one of his very interesting uh, poems is about the clothes. You know when? Almost one thousand years ago and some know I uh, know in the, in the room no passion I read in passion he says Ferestade Boyat Ferestade Darun for the macro Burun Sade he talks about sending an ambassador huh? emissary so the necessity is there and he says the person who is going to be sent as ambassador Ferestade, why at Ferestade? You should have some qualifications. 
İnsan, he should be very calculated. Very calculated. Poor means so much, huh? Much here means calculation. And Brun, outwardly, he should be so penetrating, so touching, that he can touch everybody. This is the spirit of Persian diplomacy. And I can go further. You know, we have another one, Hafez. Hafez is known in, in Turkey, I think, maybe more than Ferdowsi. And Hafez has a very interesting poem. In poem. I think this is the gist of diplomacy. You know what he says? Also, you should do it in Tafsir in the Harfas. What you stand more about? says the convenience of both this life and the day after is having friendship with friends and a type of it's very difficult to translate it Mudara is not just uh, uh, toleration it is having maybe you can translate it reducing tensions with enemies huh? having some type of arrangements with, with your enemy. It means don't make animosity deeper and make friendship as much as you can deeper. So diplomacy is not new to Iran, to the Iranian culture. And I can go to other uh, poets and the Iranian rich uh, poetry, uh, let's say, uh, books, but I would say that Iran has been consistently attach these notions. And in modern time, especially, let's say, from the establishment of modern uh, Turkish Republic, I think it is one of the best examples that where diplomacy has worked and has given fruit to cooperation. You know, Iranian-Turkish relationship during the last few decades has been based on diplomatic interaction, which has its own roots also in the past. I think it is the most stable, according to all Middle Eastern scholars who write about the region, Iranian-Turkish borders are the most stable borders in the region during the last four centuries. Because we had a treaty before Westphalia. Now, I think, Professor Vardash, most of your students know about Westphalia, 1648. But Iran and Turkey's relationship goes back to 1939 treaty of what we call Pasishin or Zohar, which has been working. <laughs> and I think if you go to detail, because for my own personal research, I'm a student of uh, diplomacy and Iranian foreign policy. I, I like the details. It is so fascinating, but it has been the base. Now, look at the recent times. Iranian-Turkish cooperation through diplomatic channels is becoming deeper and deeper. And what's interesting about it, actually I like this concept, that is becoming multi-dimensional. It is not just one dimension multi-dimensional. It has, and thanks to our ambassador here, previous ambassadors, also Turkish ambassadors, we have very good ambassadors always in, in Tehran. I've been working with them and enjoying them. And I do personally respect Tur Turkish uh, diplomatic achievements as well as Turkish diplomat diplomatic establishment. Very careful about the national interest of Turkey, always and very exemplary, I have to say, everywhere. So this relationship is becoming, through these diplomatic interactions, multi-dimensional. It means it's not just economic issue or economic dimension. It is not just cultural dimension. It is not just people to people. It is not just military and intelligence. It is all of them. And furthermore, even in each of these dimensions, it's becoming multi-dimensional. Look at the economic side. 
It's not just one economic issue between Iran and Turkey which is deepening. And actually, iranian turkish relationship defies all the American, let's say, labeling of Iran and labeling of Turkey, I have to say. And we showed that diplomacy works and cooperation bilaterally is the fruit of using diplomatic means. But it's not just bilateral. With Turkey, we have trilaterals. One a good example is Astana process. Iran, Turkey, and Russia. It was a real diplomatic game changer. Geneva couldn't achieve what it was supposed to. But Austin achieved. And it contributed to peace and security. Iranian diplomacy is not just bilateral. And bilateral is not exclusive to Turkey. We have so many bilaterals and trilaterals. But also Iranian multilateral diplomacy is very important. And nobody takes note that Iran is a founding member of the United Nations and a founding member of other international and regional organizations, including Organization of Islamic Cooperation, or OPEC, on the economic side. Why? Because diplomacy is not just in the spirit of Persian culture, it is a necessary means for achieving peace, security, and a good life. So to sum up what, what I said, I think I raised one question, why and how Iranian interaction with these two issues of peace and security and diplomacy should be studied and understood. And my answer was, a, forget what the United States says. And be careful what the United States is saying. Because it's against the principles. And look at Iran from other aspects that, yes, Iran cannot be ignored from any regional setting. And finally, cooperation through diplomacy is really uh, bearing its fruit. And may I end? by saying today's meeting is, as the professor said, is related to our diplomatic channels. We have a good embassy here, good ambassador, his staff, they are in touch with the universities, including yours, and I thank them, and thank the professor for uh, organizing this meeting, which was, it was a very good opportunity for me to talk about what I not just like, what I love, that is diplomacy. Why I love it? Because I think it is very useful, not just for one person. It is good for beyond you. It is a public good, and it's a public good which is necessary for peace, for cooperation, and I started by a joke on the difference between diplomats and escort. It was a little downgrading diplomats. Uh, but let me end by what is the spirit of diplomacy, which also I like it as a very humanistic instinct. And that is hope. Hope is the essence of diplomacy. Human agency is the essence of diplomacy that human beings can make a difference, can change the course of war to course of cooperation and peace. Diplomacy is based on human intelligence, human communication, human knowledge, and human availability for making change. And what is needed for that is hope. And they say this, a, I end by a saying which says, hope, for a diplomat is like water for is like courage for a soldier and water for fish. So let's remain hopeful that finally diplomacy <coughs> will work and work regardless of its
from his team and their lack of understanding of what diplomacy is. Thank you. and also to our university. Uh, my question is about the recent tension between US and Iran. Uh, as you may know, we are in cooperation even through municipalities, through sister cities program. However, if the tension uh, between US and Iran deepens, will this harm our cooperation because we are a member of NATO? Thank you. Can I collect questions in order to cover more, huh? Then I, if there is any more question. If not, it means the time, my talk was either convincing or boring, huh? Okay. <laughs> or both. Thank you very much, dear Ambassador. It's always a pleasure to us here. Welcome back to Turkey. Uh, I have a question on Iran-US tension, recent tension. Uh, how do you think we can avert military confrontation uh, in the lack of uh, communication and negotiation between Iran and the United States in this respect? Um, to what extent, you know, of course the remaining signatories of GCPOA will be critical, but to what extent do you envision a role for, you know, regional powers uh, for mediation like Iraq, Oman, Turkey? And uh, what role do you envisage for Turkey in this recent crisis? Thank you. So maybe one more, hmm? yes. And may inter you introduce also yourself because... Uh, my name is Sinan, I'm an uh, international relations student here. Uh, thank you for your speech, uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, I want to ask, uh, you mentioned that uh, the Astana process is working compared to Geneva process. And uh, currently, there is some sort of crisis between Turkey, uh, United States, and uh, Russia in terms of the purchase of the S 400s. And uh, today, for example, in the CNBC, it's mentioned that Turkey have only a couple of weeks left to decide to whether purchase this S hundreds. Uh, otherwise, there will be sanctions are coming. And uh, what do you think of this process? I mean, if Turkey decides to uh, not to buy this S S four hundred, it will be it will be affecting the Astana process. And uh, yeah, very good. Good question. Uh, uh, Please. Yeah, there are some embassy cars parked on the main road. Most <laughs> <laughs> of the presidential palace, they keep towing the cars, so our secretary is telling us that if any of car is parked without the driver. Please let the driver go get the car out of the way because they keep going the of the So it's the most important question to whom this car belongs. <laughs> Very good questions. Uh, I do thank uh, the questions. On the first one, uh, the recent tensions between Iran and the US uh, and how it impacts. Uh, I think, uh, first of all, we have to analyze the tension and see what are the reasons and where it is headed. The, and then of course go to where it could impact on municipalities or not. I think first of all, uh, the reason is uh, the confusion, a type of contradiction, a domestic tension in the United States. It doesn't relate to Iran at all. Iran has not done anything new or any, let's say, variable as we call it here in, in universities. The tension is between uh, what our foreign minister 
said as Guru B, these uh, four war mongers with different degree of uh, uh, militant uh, tendencies and different personal agendas and approaches. As you know, four weeks ago almost you mentioned this in a Fox News interview in New York, which I recommend you to read because that was one of the most important analytical frame for understanding the tension. Uh, they, you know, you have Bolton and the, his uh, uh, record is clear that he is a, a no-conservative, American classical no-conservative. What is the meaning it that the American conservatives think that they can create realities hmm? by using military force and this can change. Of course, he personally was one of the main uh, elements behind the invasion of Iraq in 2003. He had been on the record that he likes the same to be happening. No? On Iran. So it's a personal agenda, of course, there are interests involved. Then you have Pompo, who is a no conservative but in a different style, a Tea Party member. Hmm? You know, nuances in politics is very important and in, uh, in uh, analytical frames. He has an eye a, on, let's say, presidential campaign in post Trump era. Also, for regime change in our country, a dream hmm? which even may, may take it to, to his grave uh, because you know, regime change has been a dream for the last 40 years, but Iran has become a stronger and a stronger. But, however, he is very, uh, let's say, vivid on, on, on this uh, fact uh, that uh, he believes in this. Uh, but, however, he is the Secretary of State, his position is different from. Bolton, in terms of uh, personal uh, maneuvering and so on and so forth. Then you have, of course, uh, regional players, not only Yohu, who is the real person uh, in this region for, let's say, maybe designing all these uh, conflicts because uh, the Zionist entity likes the balkanization in this area. They don't like big states like Turkey and Iran. They want a smaller states to be created, weaker states to have their own so-called uh, strategic edge. So they, there are so many elements. Then you have a president uh, who is in very impulsive, as they say, who has been on, the agenda, uh, on a campaign of anti-war, being elected and ridiculing the others for expanding. So, so much uh, confusion uh, in that. And what we think is a psychological warfare. And Iran is not an easy cake hmm? to swallow. Iran is the only country in that region. And take note of it. That is providing its own security. We are not borrowing security. All Iranian security strength come from within software side and horror side. And they know that not just uh, militarily it's impossible, psychologically it's also impossible to think of this, uh, let's say, whole game. So as our uh, leader said, it is a war of wills. And they have a much stronger will. Uh, so it is uh, based on two a two-pillar analysis in Iran that uh, uh, war, they talk about war, but war is, an, uh, is not going to happen. And also what they say, they say we are for negotiation, it also doesn't happen. Why? Because this is not negotiation. You put a knife on my neck and say, come on, negotiate. It is submission which is not just against the Iranian revolution, I think it's against any human instinct. 
nobody accepts under uh, this situation. So I think this uh, tension has, has a lot of ups and downs, and it has uh, worried a lot, including the good friend who asked this question. But as you see, I think the situation is different today from last two weeks. And uh, everybody now understands that Iran is not that easy cake, that uh, this gang of four can, on different agendas, really uh, have on their table. So don't worry about the municipality. They should work together. And if there is more tension, more cooperation should be between municipalities. Because the Iranian people would resist. And at ti a time of resistance, what you need is more support from your neighbors and colleagues and friends. Now, uh, on the second question, what Turkey can do or the other regional players on this. I think they are trying, everybody is trying to calm down. But who should be called down? This is the question. Have we done anything new? Have we not done anything? Actually, it's a provocation by the other side. A permanent push for provocation. And in, in, in Iranian response has, has been rational, calculated, uh, prudent, and it remains so. But Iran also has said we are not for war, but we have proven in history that we have been a strong defender of our land. Uh, now on S400 that, uh, and what the US uh, I said about sanctions. I have not seen the report about sanctions, but I can understand because the U.S. is very addicted to sanctions. Very addicted, huh? As some of you are addicted to drinking more coffee during the exams, huh? More coffee. You think that more grades would come with more coffee? It wouldn't happen, huh? Or more tea sometimes, uh, cigarettes sometimes, uh, any other addiction. You know, we have different addictions, including exam time addiction, huh? Uh, but it doesn't work. It doesn't impact your grade, does it? Huh? The more you drink coffee, nothing will happen. I think what the U.S. is doing by these uh, sanctions is crippling itself. It is weaponization of economy, weaponization of uh, dollar, weaponization of financial systems, but at the end, don't worry about sanctions. Sanctions are not good, of course, nobody should welcome sanctions. But what has happened to Cuba after 50 years of sanctions? The US will has not been uh, imposed on, on Cuba. Or Iranian revolution. Sanctions are new for Iran. Hmm? Sometimes I say jokingly that we have become sanction proof. Huh? Uh, so on that part, I think uh, it is also a psychological tool. It's becoming a business in the US bureaucracy. You know now, the Treasury Department, when I was a student in the United States, never I could hear Treasury Department has a stake in foreign policy of the United States. Now, Treasury is more important, Treasury Department is more important than the State Department. There is what we call in political science bureaucratic politics. So a part of sanctioning is bureaucratic politics for different interests, it wouldn't work. But uh, I, I really don't know the details about S-400 uh, and what has happened. I even heard about uh, Turkey investing in S-500. This is what I heard, that jointly they are going to do so. Now the numbers go on, 600, 400. But what's interesting for me, as a neighbor of Turkey, this is this growing self-confidence of Turkey. Turkey may be a member of many different regional, international, military alliances, but I think Turkey is assertive, it's its own demands, own positioning, its own power, and as a neighbor of Turkey, I really enjoy this over uh, let's say, uh, 
over interesting uh, uh, sense of self-confidence and self-independence, which is very interesting. Why shouldn't Turkey be friend with this big power and that po big power? It is up to Turkey to decide, not the others to decide for Turkey. So I think I covered and I had my own propaganda in between, huh? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any more questions should I answer? Yes. That's the lady. regional uh, stability and building peace in region uh, and also say uh, without Iran it's clearly not possible. Yeah. Uh, I totally agree with that. My question is that for building peace we need to give equal conditions uh, and rights to countries. Do you think it is possible or are we going to see something like that uh, regional hegemony in the future? What is your opinion? Thank you. Very good question. Any more questions you have also? And you didn't introduce your international relation also? No. Are you studying international relation? Political science. Political science, right. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Minister. I'm the ambassador of Ireland, and I'm also the non-resident ambassador to Iran. Oh, welcome, ambassador. Um, so particularly pleased to welcome you here and to have this opportunity. Um, thank you very much for your presentation um, and the interesting points that you've made. Um, Obviously, uh, any increase in conflict or difficulties in the Gulf region uh, would be of great concern to your neighbors in that region, yeah. Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Qatar in particular, Kuwait. Um, and uh, I wonder, could you comment briefly on the state of Iran's uh, relations with those countries? and? Um, any interaction you may have had with them um, on the present difficulties between the United States and Iran. Thank you. Thank you. And one more question, maybe the final. Hello, um, I'm a political science master student, and uh, welcome, and thank you for your presentation. I would like to ask about Israel. Actually, uh, Supreme Leader Khamenei said that there will be no renegotiation or war with America, but uh, Israel um, energy minister said Iran would actually uh, go in a war with uh, Israel through proxy war or um, a real war. What do you think about it? Uh, good questions again. I think on uh, the first question, which was about uh, regional cooperation, yes, regional cooperation. I think uh, you have to define two concepts here, or three. First, region. Second, cooperation, and finally, economic. I think uh, here, yes, we have a broad region, but it is divided to different sub-regions. So the concept of sub-region is very important. And also on the cooperation, what do you mean? To what degree? To what level? If you have something in mind like European Union, or less or more, I think it should also be. And also, what do you say by economic? Right now, we have some economic interactions in the region. And you know, we have an organization, actually Turkey, Iran, and Pakistan have been the founding members of it. That is, it was RCD, right now it is ECO, Economic Cooperation Organization, and actually these three are the base of its foundation, but now we have Central Asians uh, attached also to this. There is, we can say, a degree of regional cooperation economically. But if you mean more, I think yes, bilateral it's happening. But uh, the sum of bilaterals can be translated to a regional. Of course, the capacity is there. But I think what's important in your 
question is the political side of economic cooperation. I think the region is so securitized, the issues are so politicized, and I think even extra-regional players like United States really don't want any regional cooperation in the Persian Gulf. Because if there is regional cooperation there, then what would be their use? They, they are there because they want to get more, let's say, benefit by perpetuation of the demonization of Iran. Uh, but I think it's a possibility we have to work and there are different plans and schemes and different mini organizations working. Now, uh, the ambassador, uh, pleasure to meet you here. And I have to say actually, uh, not because you are a distinguished ambassador of Ireland to our country uh, as well as Turkey. Uh, I have uh, visited your country a couple of times and I read your country's history and I'm impressed. That's how a small uh, country, when it is determined and has, is proud of its own identity, by its own culture, can stand up. Doesn't mean always uh, fight, but I think this concept of resistance is, is highly embedded in your culture, which I appreciate and I'm impressed. And I'm also impressed by your country's production of literature, especially in English literature, Angela's Ashes and so on and so forth. But on uh, your question, uh, how uh, our relationship, look, there is, uh, I'm happy that you brought this question, there is a tendency on generalization, Iranian so-called behavior in the region, Iranian relationship with the uh, Arab side of the Persian Gulf. Uh, Iranian relationship with Europe. I think these are very general, general, general statements which neglect the details, including uh, the Persian Gulf uh, neighbors of Arab origin. Look, we have one of the best of relationship with Oman. It's a tension-free, it is an exemplary relationship of cooperation. Almost I cannot mention any major, even minor, problem in our relationship. It's a working. Look at Qatar. It's a very good relationship. Look at Kuwait. It is different from the zoo, but it still is a friendly, cordial relationship. The uh, only, and you look at even Emirates. Yes, we have uh, some challenges, but there are diversity of opinion on Iran among these Emirates. Yes, Abu Dhabi has more financial power. It, it, it, it could really use up more space, politically speaking, after 2008 uh, crisis in, uh, uh, in Dubai but you see differences among, among them. So, uh, when you go to, of course, Saudi Arabia and Bahrain, they are different. We don't, uh, it's my own understanding that uh, Bahrain is not considered very significant in this whole game. It's an extension of uh, uh, Saudi policy in a way. E even it's inside Saudi Arabia, there are tensions that uh, is this policy working, is it good or not? So you cannot have a generalized uh, picture. Furthermore, it is not just the issue of Iran among these states, which is the source of tension. In Persian, we say it was not my aunt, Amema Nabut, who was trying to strangle Qatar. For sure it was not my aunt, huh? It was UAE and it was Saudi Arabia, of course Bahrain was also with them. They really encircled Qatar. And if it was not Iranian space, and Iranian ports open to Qatar, then Qatar would have been strangled. Uh, so I think uh, the tensions 
or multi-layer in, in that. And the tensions inside each of them uh, should be taken into account. We are not for increasing tensions. We are for cooperation. And on the cooperative side, I think we utilize whatever is possible. And as you know, the day before yesterday, on uh, Monday uh, afternoon, uh, Foreign Minister of Oman, uh, Ben Alawi was in Iran in his route to London, so there are consultations going on, and everybody is trying to contain the radical elements. Iran is not for radical approaches, but they are all on the other side. Radical approaches for changing political realities by inviting third party factors, which is not good. But however, I think if uh, they take into account their common interest, the common interest is, of course, reducing tensions. Now on the issue of the Zionist uh, regime, I think this issue of proxy also is one of the issues that need to be scrutinized. You know, simplification is the worst analytical disease for any pseudo international politics. They want to neglect the complexities of the most important conflict in the region, which is the Palestinian plight, huh? by bringing the issue of proxies. They want to reduce the totality of a very chronic crisis, crisis to simply, you know, finger, pre, uh, finger pointing to several uh, actors. I think this is wrong. Right now, look what's happening there. It's 70 years that Palestinians are deprived from their basic fundamental human rights, which is right to be in your own homeland. Who is doing so? It's not my aunt again, huh? It is the Israeli regime which is against against any rights of Palestinians. But in order to evade the challenges, difficulties, and what they have done, the violations, they uh, divert the attention to the others, which is not working because at the end. Uh, regardless of what they have done, the still Palestinian cause is, is alive and it's going to be one of the most fundamental shapers of the region that we have ahead. So should I answer more questions, Professor? Or? No, some of them are leaving, which means time is up. Huh? Some of them are, but I think... Maybe last round. Last round? Yeah. We don't want to keep the ambassadors who are older here, you know. <laughs> okay. Excellency, just short question. You mentioned uh, something about an article in Fox News. Is it your article? It's what? You mentioned something about an article two weeks ago in Fox News or report. I? You recommended us to read that article, that's why. Which one? You, uh, the article about the conflict between Iran and USA. Oh, but no, actually, uh, no, it's Lush. What? I'm alive, now you divert what I said. <laughs> Sorry, Lush, Lush. Now I remember, I said, no, I'm not that uh, still Alzheimer's, you know. But, but what you said, I was doubting about myself. Did I get Alzheimer's in 10 minutes, you know? The President Ronald Reagan uh, got Alzheimer's, you know, he went to doctor, and doctor said, Mr. President, I have a bad news and I have a good news. He said, what's the good, bad news? Doctor said, well, bad news is that you got Alzheimer's. So what's the good news, the President was? And he said, you will forget in 10 minutes. I thought maybe I'm in the same position. <laughs> I didn't look, I didn't talk about article, I didn't talk about proxy, and I didn't talk about a month ago, huh? 
I said there is an interview hmm, by our foreign minister huh, with Fox News huh, and read it by scripture and I mentioned I think few weeks ago or four weeks ago, not month, one month. So when I am alive, it is not my aunt which changing my words, it's you. So read again, it is an interview by Fox. Joking, of course, you know, I like jokes, jokes is the most important part of life. Okay, any more questions? Yes. Professor, it's yes, you have a question. Thank you, Mr. Professor. Uh, I am uh, Kerem Okyay, uh, top uh, international relations uh, uh, student at Top University. Uh, you mentioned uh, about uh, pressure uh, of United States against uh, Iran, and uh, you said uh, Iranian people will uh, resist against them. Actually, they are resisting for years, uh, and my question is, uh, uh, what if they uh, stop resisting and uh, don't want uh, Islamic Republic anymore? What will you do in that case? Thank you. It is what we call a hypothetical question. Hmm? What if is not an, a precise uh, question, but uh, I think your question is a loaded one. You know what's a loaded one? Huh? It is loaded with the political orientation. Iranians are resisting the imperial hegemonic desires and they are proud of their resistance and they are together one voice that we are against the Jews. Thank you, Professor, because of your capacity as a professor capacity, not the ambassador one. Hope to see your ambassador capacity again, maybe next year, maybe later. And this is our senior uh, from us to you. Hope you accept. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please join me.